Hello students. Today I am going to teach you the topic CQ scheduling and the sub topics which we are going to discuss are scheduling criteria, the types of scheduling algorithm and multiple processor scheduling. First thing we should know what is scheduling and how the operating system schedule processes and CPU. The basic concept is there is in a single processor system only one process can run at a time and any other must wait until the CPU is free and can be rescheduled. And the objective of multiprogramming is to have some process running at all times and to maximize the CPU utilization. The idea is relatively simple. A process is executed until it is must wait and typically for the completion of some of input output requests. In a simple computer system, the CPU then first sits idle and all the waiting time is wasted and no useful work is accomplished. And with the help of a multi-programming, we try to use this time productively. The success of schedule, scheduling uh, depends on the observed properties of processes. If process execution of a cycle of a CPU execution and input output wait, process alternate between these two states only. That is, the process execution begins with a CPU burst and that is followed by an input output burst which is followed by another CPU burst, then another input output burst and so on which we can see in this particular figure. As from this particular graph, we can understand that few, few bursts are the long burst and few bursts are the short burst. And the, this particular graph is in hypo exponential graph and the CPU burst basically varies from process to process and from computer to computer. The CPU scheduling is basically done by the scheduler, that is the main operation, your main control um, by the operating system is on scheduler and whenever the CPU becomes idle, the operating system must select one of the processes in the ready queue to be executed. The selection process is carried out by the scheduler and the scheduler selects to a process from the process in memory that are ready to execute and allocates the CPU that, to that process. In previous classes also I told you that there are three types of a scheduler, long term scheduler, short term scheduler and medium term scheduler. In a long term scheduler, we basically select the processes from secondary storage devices and in short term scheduler, we select among the processes that are ready to execute and allocate the CPU to one of them. And in medium term scheduler, the scheduler is required at the time where a process is to be removed from the memory and thus to reduce the degree of multiprogramming. For the scheduling, there are two types of a scheduling. One is non-primitive and second is primitive. In a non-primitive scheduling, once the CPU has been allocated to a process, the process keeps the CPU until its termination or transition to the block state. That means that once a CPU is allocated to a process, this process can use the CPU for its own execution till it willingly surrenders or leaves the CPU. In a primitive scheduling, even if the CPU has been allocated to a certain process, it can snatch from this process anytime, either due to the time constraint or due to priority reason. It implies that if a process with higher priority becomes ready, to, ready for its execution, the process which is currently using the CPU will be forced to give up the CPU so that higher priority job can run fast. And now, which type of a uh, scheduling is being harder to implement? Primitive is quite harder because it, need it needs maintenance for the consistency. The data is being shared among the process and more importantly, the um, uh, kernel data structure, that is the information which has been stored by the kernel. So primitive is quite harder than non-primitive. Dispatcher. Dispatcher is an another component which is involved in the CPU scheduling and it is the program which is responsible for assigning the CPU to the process which has been selected by the short term scheduler. Assigning the CPU to a ready process involves three basically major steps, the context switching, the switching to user mode from monitor mode and the restart the execution of a process. In as I already told you, the context switching, as the name indicates, it implies the switching of CPU from one process to another. This involves saving the state of old process and loading the saved state, if any, for this ready process. Switching to user mode from monitor mode, a user process must be run in user mode. Therefore, mode must be changed from monitor mode to user mode. 
and restart the execution of a process the execution of a process should be restart by jumping to the instruction that was supposed to be executed when this process was last interrupted or to the first instruction if the ready process is to be executed for the first time after its creation what is a dispatch latency it is a basically the time taken by the dispatcher to stop one process and start another one there are few criteria or i should say the goals or the performance matrices which has to be keep in mind while scheduling the processes first is cpu utilization that is we want to keep the cpu as busy as possible conceptually the cpu utilization can from 0 to 100 percent throughput if the cpu is busy executing processes then work is being done one measure of work is the number of processes that are completed per unit time is called throughput turn around time from the point of view of a particular process the important criteria is how long it time how long it takes to execute that process the interval from the time of submission of a process to the time of that completion is the turn around time waiting time the cpu scheduling algorithm does not affect the amount of time during which a process execute or does input output it affects the amount that a process spend waiting in the ready queue and waiting time is basically the sum of the period spend waiting in the ready queue response time in an interactive system the turn around time may not be the best criteria often a process can produce some output fairly early and can continue computing new results while previous results are being output to the user thus the another measure is the time for the submission of request until the first response is produced and this measure is called response time uh, basically it is a time it takes to start the responding not the time it takes to output the response so the turn around time is generally limited by the speed of the output device there are six types of a scheduling algorithm the first scheduling algorithm is a first come first serve scheduling and it is the simplest of all the scheduling algorithm and the key concept of this algorithm is to allocate the cpu in order in which the processes arise and when the cpu is free it is allocated to the process which is occupying the front of the queue and once this process goes into the running state the process control block is removed from the queue and this algorithm is only uh, does non preemptive scheduling by this example i explains to you how the first come first scheduling is being implemented consider the this particular example here we have a three processes p1 p2 p3 and their burst time is written it is, the unit of burst time is millisecond as process p1 requires 24 millisecond p2 3 and p3 3 millisecond the this particular thing this uh, figure this is known as a gantt chart it is basically shows a time sharing system how the process gets a uh, chance to get uh, executed and at what time the process uh, freeze the critical section or the cpu and how the next process is being scheduled so firstly from the table also we can see the first particular process p1 arrives when p1 arrives the, it gets the chance for the execution and uh, earlier also i told you before also i told you that it is a non preemptive type scheduling that is once the cpu is being allocated to a particular process then this process can use the cpu for its own execution till it willingly surrenders or leaves the cpu so for uh, for 24 milliseconds the process p1 p1 will going to be get allocated with the cpu then as as it leaves the uh, finishes its work then p2 is being allocated and then p3 is being allocated and this particular chart is known as a gantt chart so while calculating and uh, this question and uh, these types of a scheduling algorithms are the part of the numerical so there will be two parts which definitely will be going asked with you that is what is the waiting time and what is the turn around time and how to calculate the waiting time when when the process how much time the process has to wait as in the scheduling criteria we i told you what is waiting time waiting time is the sum of the period spent waiting in the ready queue so process uh, how much time the process p1 has to wait the process p1 didn't wait so it is on 0 millisecond p2 
P2 wait for the for the execution. P2 wait for the 24 millisecond, and P3 wait for the 27 millisecond. And how to calculate the average? Adding the sum uh, sum of all the three waiting times divided by three because the processes are three. So by this you can uh, find out the uh, average waiting time and the waiting time of a particular process. Suppose that processes arrive in the order of P2, P3, P1. In the previously it was being the sequences P1, P2, P3. When the sequence changes, then firstly the P2 requires three millisecond per second, P3 requires three, and P1 requires twenty-four. The Gantt chart for this particular will be firstly the P2, then P3, then P1. Now the waiting time of the P1 is, as we can see, the P1 get the chance for the execution is after 6 milliseconds the p1 get the chance p2 get 0 millisecond and p3 get 3 millisecond so individually we find out the uh, waiting time of all the three processes and now summing up with this three processes uh, waiting times and divided by three will be the average waiting time of uh, this uh, sequence of processes which we arrive Now, as in the previous experiment, the average waiting time is 17. And by changing the sequencing order, now the average waiting time is 3. So this order is more better uh, if we calculate the waiting time. That less in less time, the processes get the chance for the execution. Next type of a scheduling is a shortest job of uh, scheduling. It is a different approach to CPU scheduling and this algorithm associates with each process the length of the process next CPU burst. The key concept of this algorithm is the CPU is allocated to the process with the least CPU burst time. And this algorithm is being implemented on both the types of a scheduling. That is, we can have a non-printive shortest job scheduling as well as a preemptive shortest job scheduling. by taking with the help of an example as we can see here the number of processes are 4 p1 p2 p3 and we are, as well as we can write the arrival time also at what time the process p1 arrives for the execution p2 arrives at 2.0 p3 arrives for 4.40 and p3 arrives for the 5.0 and the, for the completion and the, for the execution the p1 requires 7 millisecond burst time p2 requires 4 millisecond burst time p3 requires 1 milli burst second uh, millisecond and P4 requires 4 millisecond. The Gantt chart, as per the approach, is a non preemptive. It means once the once it is being allocated to the CPU, uh, until and unless it surrenders, it won't be uh, given to other processes. For the process P1, as we can see, for P1 gets 7 milliseconds. So Till 7 millisecond, the CPU is being allocated to the P1. After that, in this, we have to see the shortest job first. It means the shortest burst time is being given to which process has the shortest burst time. So, but in 0 millisecond, we can see first process which arrives is P1. P1 arrives, it is given to P1 at 2.0, but it requires 7. So seven after seven millisecond, which process is to be allocated? See, P two already being uh, on the ready state. P three is also on the ready state, and P four is also on the ready state. How we are getting to know it is in ready state? Because till seven millisecond, the P, uh, CPU is being allocated to process P one. Okay. Now after completion of the process P one, to whom we have to allocate the CPU? Now we will going to check whose burst time is lower. The burst time which is having a low, less burst, uh, the process which is having a less burst time is process P3. Then the allocation is given to the process P3. After one millisecond, now the leftover processes are P2 and P4. Then we, both, both were having the same burst time. Then we will going to check the arrival time. According to the arrival, who reaches first or who approaches first will be going to be allocated. Then the process P2 is being allocated with the CPU. And after that, process P4 is being allocated. 
now we have to check the waiting time of each process process is process p1 has to wait no at 0 millisecond only he has to he has get the cpu for the process p2 see process p2 get at 8 millisecond the cpu the first response he get on at 8 millisecond but the arrival time of p2 is 2.0 so 8 minus 2.0 6 millisecond it means for the 6 millisecond the process p2 has to wait for the execution for the p3 p3 get at 7 7 millisecond the p3 get the chance or the first response for the cpu but the p3 arrives in the state in the ready state at 4 millisecond so 7 minus 4 is 3 and for the p4 the p4 arrive at 5 and it going to he get the chance the process get the chance at 12 millisecond so 12 minus 5 is 7 so this is the waiting time of process P1, it is the waiting time of process P2, it is the waiting time of process P3 and this is the waiting time of process P4. Summing up and doing divided by the number of processes is the average waiting time. And this approach is known as for the non-printive scheduling. For the preemptive scheduling, same sequence, same burst time, everything is same but now the type of the scheduling is Preemptive. That is, according to the arrival time, the process will going to be uh, will be allocated to other process. See, at zero millisecond, who arrives firstly? The process P1 arrives. So, at for process P1, the CPU is being allocated. But at time 2.0, who knocked process P2 knocked? And now we are going to compare the burst time. Actually, uh, for the 2 millisecond, the process piece, uh, the remaining burst time for the process P1 will be 5 because for the 2 millisecond, it's already being executed. So the remaining burst time for the process P1 is 5. When I am telling you for this 5, after 2 millisecond, when P2 is being preemptive to get for the execution and the burst time of process P2 is 4 which is lesser obviously p2 so the cpu execution being allocated to whom process p2 now the next preemption is done by process p3 by uh, at 4 millisecond at 4 millisecond how much the process p2 is being executed for uh, 2 and remaining is true okay now 4 millisecond now p3 is being preempted compare the burst time which is lesser Process P2 burst time is 2 millisecond and process P3 burst time is 1 millisecond, which is lesser process P3. So the CPU is execution is given to the P3. At 5 millisecond, by default, the P3 requires 1 millisecond only and at 5 millisecond, the execution of P3 is being completed. Now, remaining are, remaining are process P4, process P2 and process P1. P1 and P2 is in the ready state. P4 is also on the ready state. But P4 is instantly arrived at in the ready state. And the arriving time is 5 millisecond, which is lesser. 5, 5 for P4, 2 for P2, and uh, 5 for P1. So now it is being allocated to P4. After the completion of P4, next chance is given to P1. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, P4, uh, P process P4 has a 4 millisecond burst time, process P2 has a 2 millisecond burst time, and process P1 has a 5 millisecond burst time. And now I'm talking, talking about for the 5 millisecond. For the 5 millisecond, whose burst time is less? P2. So it is being allocated to P2. Then it is being allocated to P4, and then it is being allocated to P1. Now, individually, we're going to calculate the waiting time. For the P1, we can see... Uh, firstly, when it came, directly it was being allocated, so there is no waiting time. Then it is being 11, but for the 2 millisecond, it's already being executed. So 11 minus 2 is 9. For the P2, P2 arrives at 2. 2 pe hi aaya, to usko wait nahi karna pada. But 5 pe wapas usko aaya, to 5 minus 4, 8. So P2 ko kiti dir wait karna pada hai? For the 1 millisecond. P3 char pe hi aya aur char pe hi usko mil gaya to wait nahi karna pada 0 millisecond P4 5 pe aya 5 pe hi mil gaya ne P4 ko mila 7 pe to usko 7 minus 5 is 2 to 2 millisecond se liye wait karna pada sabko add karo divide by the number of process is known as an average waiting time for this particular example 
So in this we get to know in a shortest job first, the key concept is that that CPU is being allocated to the process with the least CPU burst time. Next is the priority scheduling algorithm. In the priority scheduling algorithm, each process in the system, if a given priority, then the scheduling must be done according to the priority of each process. A higher priority job should get a CPU, whereas lower priority job can be made to wait. And the key concept for this algorithm is priority scheduling is necessarily a form of preemptive scheduling where priority is basis of preemption. The major problem with priority scheduling algorithm is an indefinite blocking or a starvation. A process that is ready to run but waiting for the CPU can be considered blocked. A priority scheduling algorithm can leave some lower priority process waiting indefinitely. And the solution to this problem of indefinite blockage of a lower priority process is aging. Aging is a technique of gradually increasing the priority of process that waits in the system for a long time. Now we take an example. Example is that we can see here are the four processes defined with their burst time. And here uh, one more new terminology is being introduced that is a time quantum that after 20 milliseconds we can switch among the processes according to the uh, according to their priorities. Okay. Firstly, before discussing to the priority, I should tell you the round robin scheduling. In the round robin scheduling, the algorithm is designed especially for time sharing system and it is similar to uh, first come first scheduling, but preemption is added to switch between processes. A small unit of time is called a time quantum or a time slice is defined and the key concept of this algorithm is consider a set of processes lined up in the ready queue and the processes are taken out of the ready queue in first come first serve order. Now we consider an example. It is an example of a round robin scheduling and the time pointer for uh, switching among the processes 20 milliseconds. The sequence order will be the same as it is being shown in the uh, table. That is firstly it is being allocated to P1, then P2, then P3, then P4. Now according to the 20 milliseconds, how many times the P1 will be going to be allocated? See? 1, 2, 3. 20, 40, and then 30. So P1 is being allocated the CPU for the three times. For the P2, 17 only. In first attempt only, the whole execution is being completed. P3, 20, 40, 60, plus 8. And P4, 20, plus 4. Okay. In every 20 millisecond, it is being switched among the uh, processes only. So the performance of round robin algorithm depends heavily on the size of the time quantum. If the time quantum is extremely small, the round robin approach is called processor sharing. So higher average turnaround, then shortage job, but better response. Next is a multi-level queue scheduling. The key concept of this algorithm has been created for the situation in which the processes are easily classified into two different groups. For example, a common division is made between uh, mo common division is mode between foreground that is an interactive processes and the background batch process. And these two process these two types of processes have different response time requirements and so may have different scheduling needs. So in a multi-level queue scheduling uh, algorithm, the partitions the ready queue into the several separate queues, the processes are permanently assigned to one queue, generally based on some properties of the process, such as memory size, process priority, and process type. Each queue has its own scheduling algorithm, and in addition, there must be a scheduling amongst the queue, which is commonly implemented as fixed priority preemptive scheduling. 
let us look at the for this particular example here we can see the multi-level queue scheduling algorithm have five queues listed below in the order of priority that is firstly the system processes then interactive processes interactive editing processes batch processes and the student price so here the highest priority is being given to the system process and the lowest priority to the student process and each queue has absolute priority over lower priority queues and another possibility in time slicing among the queues here each queue, queue get a certain portion of the cpu time which it can then schedule among its various processes in a multi-level feedback queue scheduling, when the multi-level queue scheduling algorithm is used, the processes are permanently assigned to a queue when they enter the system. The multi-level feedback queue scheduling algorithm is in contrast uh, among a process to move between queues and the idea is to separate the processes according to the characteristics of their CPU bus. If a process uses too much CPU time, it will be moved to lower priority process queue and this scheme leaves input output bound and interactive processes in the higher priority queue. In addition, a process that waits too long in a lower priority queue may be moved to a higher priority queue and this form of aging prevents starvation. In general, a multi-level feedback queue scheduler is defined by the following parameters. That is how many number of queues, the scheduler algorithm for each queue, the method used to determine when to upgrade a process to a higher priority queue, and this method used to determine when to de denote a process to a lower priority queue, and the method used to determine which queue a process will enter when the process needs service. Thank you.